right now. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people are interested in getting back out on the, on the road. I think people, have, um, you know, maybe took time off, uh, or been cycling, uh, solo, but, but interested in, in getting back out there, riding in groups and, um, a lot of questions about the safety of that and, and what we can do, um, to, uh, to continue to do that. So, um, I'm uh, one of the cardiologists with UCLA Health. Uh, my office is in Ventura, um, but I go down to, to Westwood and am involved in the interventional program as well as sports cardiology down there. Um, and I was also on the UCLA cycling team when I was an undergrad in medical school uh, many years ago and try to, to continue to support them and stay involved with, uh, with UCLA cycling as well. So um, very uh, interested in, in uh, this topic myself. So, um, let me click on to the next one. Um, so initially just some disclosures. I don't have any uh, kind of financial interest in this uh, topic specifically. Um, and I will bring up a couple of specific products, apps, devices we'll, we'll talk about. And I, we, don't have any kind of financial interest or specifically endorse any of them. They're just brought up as examples. Um, in addition, I am not a virologist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not necessarily a COVID-19 expert um, in that way, nor am I a crystal ball reader. I think that our uh, knowledge of this topic continues to evolve. Um, and there's constantly research that is, is going on and um, especially in the beginning, our, I feel like our uh, expectations of what was happening and uh, it was changing on a weekly basis. So um, what I talk about now may be different in a month or, or in a week. <laughs> so we'll, we'll stick with that. Um, I'm also going to try to avoid any kind of the politics is just sort of the evidence that we have and, and um, what we know works um, in staying, uh, staying safe here. So. Um, in addition, you know, infectious disease is uh, in, in something like this in a public health setting is really a, a matter of statistical probability. Um, there is no, uh, almost no 100% uh, risk or 100% safe. Um, and so we just try to reduce the probability that we'll get infected or that something will happen um, unless you're essentially out in the middle of nowhere, sus like growing your own food and have no contact with the outside, um, there is gonna be some degree of risk um, in interacting with the environment and other people. So um, everyone sort of has to take that into account for themselves um, and the risks that, that uh, pertain to you and your importance in cycling your exercise and, and you know, the importance of that in your life as well, um, the benefits that you get from it. Um, and then, you know, since it is a, a public health issue as well, you have to weigh the risks to those around you. Um, so if you live with people who are at higher risk, immunosuppressed or elderly or comorbidities, um, then you have to take that into account as well, that it's not just, uh, you know, your risk if you get infected that you have to talk about as well. Um, so, you know, first of all, um, you know, Regular exercise and, and especially cycling is, is really beneficial. So anything that we can do to sort of encourage this, get people out on the, on the bike and exercising again, has wide ranging of benefits um, in not only in the, the cardiovascular and um, you know, reducing diabetes and the normal things that we think of, but it also actually decreases the risk of several types of cancers, including, including breast cancer and colon cancer. Um, improves uh, mental health and oh, dementia, right. um, improves uh, the, um, your, your strength and reduces risk of hip fractures as we age. And there is actually a mortality um, benefit that you get from, uh, from exercise as well. People live longer with regular exercise. So as much as we can encourage people getting out there, you know, cycling to work or, or, or riding, um, regularly, we want to try to do that and get out there. Um, specifically with the immune system, um, we do have a specific benefit of getting regular exercise, regular moderate intensity exercise on the immune system. So this is likely multifactorial. A lot of, you know, different mechanisms is very complex. 
Um, but some of the possible um, mechanisms include improving the immune cell function, uh, increasing the amount of antibodies that are in your mucosa, in the airway and nasal passages that fights uh, that initial um, infection or, or source of infection, um, decreases stress hormones, it uh, decreases the pro-inflammatory proteins and increases the anti-inflammatory proteins. Um, there's a physical clearance aspect of the airways um, uh, of uh, ex expectorating um, bacteria and products. Um, and then while you're exercising, it also increases your core temperature, which can um, impede the growth of bacteria as well, similar to if you have a fever uh, fighting an infection. That's part of your body's innate immune system. So um, this is the, the first half of the curve that, that we do see a decrease in, in illness uh, with the improvement of the immune system with moderate intensity exercise. What is a little less clear is the effect of, uh, on the immune system of very strenuous exercise. So there is actually some evidence in some studies that um, really high intensity prolonged exercise does at least temporarily depress the immune system um, in similar ways to what we talked about with moderate intensity exercise, but in the wrong direction. So decreasing in those antibodies in the mucosa, decreasing temporarily some of those circulating immune cells with all the metabolites, you get some increase in free oxygen radicals and higher levels of stress hormones and you get some muscle inflammation as well. So there's this um, hypothesis that there is uh, this open window after an intense exercise that could last a few hours or possibly up to a few days. Um, one of the studies that, one of the first studies that um, I saw that kind of looked at this was a, a study at the LA Marathon in 1990 um, with a uh, basically a survey of runners compared to runners who dropped out of the race, not because they were sick. Um, so comparing those fairly, uh, two fairly similar uh, groups of people. Um, and there was about a six times uh, increase in self-reported cold symptoms in the people that actually ran the marathon. Um, now the caveat to that is that this was again self-reported cold symptoms, and those types of symptoms, um, you know, congestion, uh, you know, fatigue, illness, um, can be uh, a factor or may not actually be an infection. Um, so there are other things like allergies, asthma, um, you know, inhaling dry, polluted, or cold air can give you. Uh, very similar symptoms without it actually being a, a virus or a bacteria. So um, a lot of the, I don't think many of these studies actually ran viral cultures or, or anything like that. It was a lot of it was just self-reported. So this may not be, um, you know, as a, as big of an effect as this this study showed specifically. Um, so, um, but there, I think there is a, you know, enough evidence out there, not just that study, but um, the people think that there's this J-shaped curve that for recreational um, or, you know, regular sort of athletes that these high intensity bouts will increase your, your susceptibility to an illness. Um, there is a, a note, and this was, this was a study or a, a review paper with the Olympic Committee looking at real elite athletes, um, the, the worldwide, um, world-class, I mean, Olympic athletes, probably the tour riders and people like that, um, that, they, that they actually have a, a lower risk of uh, these viral illnesses than the general population. So um, for whatever reason, these you know, special individuals who've gotten to that level um, seem to, uh, seem to not have this high increase in illness risk that the re recreational, us mere mortals have after these exercises. Um, so uh, just for some you know, clarification on what I'm talking about in terms of moderate and strenuous exercise, um, one way to look at that is by looking at your heart rate. Um, a lot of people use heart rate monitors when they're exercising. I do, and I, I encourage my patients to. Uh, to keep an eye on their heart rate. 
Um, and so your heart rate range is your maximum heart rate, uh, either on a treadmill exercise test to maximum exertion or uh, on a uh, doing your own kind of maximal exertion test out on the road when you're cycling, um, and then minus your resting heart rate. So if you take that range, the moderate intensity exercise is going to be basically 40 to 60% of that heart rate range. If you go purely off of your maximum heart rate, then something like 64 to 76% of your maximum heart rate. So this corresponds to on a kind of a perceived exertion scale of a somewhat hard effort on like a five out of 10 or a six out of 10 in intensity. Um, and kind of like a zone two uh, up to a zone three effort. Compared to strenuous exercise, you're going hard on the bike, you know, seven out of 10 or, or eight out of 10 of perceived exertion, and you're getting heart rate up from in this range into the 60 to 90% of, of that range. So these are your zone four and five efforts. Um, and these are sort of the, the zones that I'm talking about you know, zone two and zone three are, you know, the, the modern intensity exercise. Um, these numbers are slightly different, but they're in the same, very similar range from this, this graphic. Um, and these types of exercise are, you know, great for keeping fitness, fat burning, um, and for helping out the immune system. The higher intensity intervals you're going to those four and five um, levels are, are going to build your, your VO2 max and, and help with, with other type of, um, of fitness. So um, we know that, that this level, at least the, the moderate two and three, um, will, will benefit the immune system. So, um, so going on to kind of COVID specifically, this, uh, this virus, the you know, official name is SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus that has a single-stranded RNA um, and it resides naturally in bats and rodents. We think that this one came from, came from bats um, based on the genetic analysis. And the corona came from these spike proteins that you've all heard about forming a crown around the, around the virus. Um, and it's these spike proteins that allow it entry into the cells and that we can hopefully um, target with antibodies and with, uh, with vaccines. Um, there are four other coronaviruses that are very common that, co that cause the common cold. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mentioned that just because I think that this coronavirus spreads in a similar way to other respiratory viruses like the common cold. And so that's where all of these recommendations on hand washing and, and, uh, staying away from people with uh, social thing and masks comes into play because uh, of this similar sort of spread. Genetically, it's actually more similar to the the SARS, um, which was like SARS-CoV-1, uh, is 79% similar, um, but was uh, did not spread as easily as as the current um, current pandemic. Um, so. Like I said, this, this spike protein uh, uses the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor to get into the cells. And this is present all over the body. And this is really, really where the symptoms of COVID come from um, because it's on epithelial cells around the body, not only the lungs, but also in the heart, all the blood vessels, the kidney, your taste buds, and um, and nasal uh, olfactory sensors for your taste and smell, um, liver, small intestine, there's GI, uh, GI effects of this virus. Um, and so it's really an entire body illness. And we, we see that especially in the people who have uh, more severe symptoms and end up hospitalized. Um, so the modes of transmission of this in regards to um, cycling uh, first is we call fomites or inanimate objects that you you touch, you transmit the, the virus onto these surfaces, and then somebody else um, touches them and then touches their face. So the only way for coronavirus to really get into your body is that somebody's respiratory droplets 
has to come from their airway and get into your airway. So if you um, touch these surfaces, you then have to touch your face or you know your, your lips, your nose, your, your eyes um, in order to actually get it in. If it's only on your hands, then, and you wash your hands, then you're gonna be safe. Um, so hence the recommendation of, of washing your hands frequently. Um, in cycling, this is gonna come into play more when you stop for breaks, um, you know, stop for your, your coffee break or you're sharing, uh, sharing bars or sharing uh, uh, drinks on the road, um, or uh, I guess stopping for a flat tire and, and helping somebody out and, and direct contact that way. So these are things to, to think about. Um, the main uh, thing that, the main way of uh, transmission that we want to consider um, for us is respiratory droplets. Um, so this is not only coughing and this wonderful sneeze like this gentleman is doing, um, but also just in, in speaking um, and in heavy breathing when you're riding, uh, you are letting out small respiratory droplets um, when, you're, um, when you're doing those things. Um, there was that uh, interesting epidemiology study from um, uh, the church choir in Washington, I believe it was, where you had a large group of, of people. They weren't, uh, they were social distancing sort of, they weren't hugging or, or shaking hands, but they were all in the same room singing and that let out enough respiratory droplets that a, a huge number of them um, actually uh, came down uh, with uh, that the illness spread. Um, so, uh, so this is what we'll, we'll be talking about mostly. There's a lot of talk about aerosolized um, spread. Now, um, I, I do believe that this is um, probably, you know, probably true. I just don't think that it's all that important for, for cycling, for being outdoors. And I'll go into that in more detail, but aerosolization is when these droplets um, are, are so small that the virus can survive in such small droplets that they stay in the air and linger for um, minutes to hours. So somebody may get into, a, into an elevator and, and cough or sneeze or something and these droplets hang out staying in the air for hours and then other people get into the elevator later and, uh, and get infected. Or the, you know, it gets in the air and it goes through air ducts um, and can spread to other rooms in a hotel or other rooms uh, you know, in the building and spread that way. So it's really sort of an indoors phenomenon, I think. And outside, um, there's enough air dispersion uh, that, and other factors that I think that aerosolization is not as much something that we need to think about, but more the respiratory droplets and, and staying a certain distance away from people. Um, so outdoors, um, I don't know the exact number. I don't think anybody knows um, exactly what factor it is reduced by. Um, again, this is all sort of probability anyway. Um, but outside, there is increased ventilation, there is increased volume uh, of air that disperses the particles and the viral particles. Um, there is inactivation by ultraviolet sunlight radiation. Um, and then the temperature outside and the humidity also makes a, a difference um, in factoring into how long the virus can, can survive as well. So all of these things are favorable. Um, so that out, uh, exercising outdoors um, is going to be much safer than uh, if you were running next to somebody on a treadmill inside of a gym. And that's why all the gyms are still closed um, or they've moved their, their um, exercise equipment outside for people to, to still show up and exercise outside in a safer way. Um, one thing that, uh, that I do want to mention is uh, this concept of the inoculation dose. So the minimum effective dose uh, or minimum infective dose is the number of viral particles needed to cause an infection in, in the average person. So to cause an infection in 50% of people that get exposed to that dose. So in other types of viruses like the initial SARS or in influenza, we have seen that the number of viral particles that somebody is exposed to initially correlates with then the disease severity, how, how severe of an infection they get. Um, there is some 
evidence that this is the case in SARS-CoV-2 as well, um, with healthcare workers getting exposed to much higher doses with sicker patients and multiple patients, that they might come down with a, a more severe illness. So with, uh, with us, um, this means that some of these, these measures like social distancing um, and masks, even if they don't 100% um, block the transmission, it may at least reduce the number of viral particles that you're getting and could reduce the, the severity of the subsequent illness, even, even if you got uh, infected. So these measures, again, nothing is 100%, but even if we reduce the number of particles with, to some amount with, with a mask, even if it's not a perfect mask, like a N95 or better, then uh, it's gonna be beneficial to us. So um, I know people have questions about masks, what types of masks should I be wearing it when, when cycling? Um, so um, talking a little bit about the types of masks that are out there. So um, I think the preferred types of masks are gonna be anything with multiple layers. Um, these cotton multiple layered ones. Um, I have one like this that's uh, cotton has has two layers um, was I think four dollars from um, some website and um, that's going to provide a decent amount of, of protection for most things. There's other uh, sort of sporty masks that are polypropylene again multiple layered. Um, some have filter inserts and then there's like the picture here, the kind of medical grade surgical masks or uh, N95 masks, um, which I have, I use, I have multiple N95 masks that I rotate, dry them out in a paper bag to sort of decontaminate them. And this is what I wear when I'm seeing patients um, in the hospital. And, uh, but I, you don't want to ride a bike wearing that. It's just going to be, you're, you're going to have a hard time breathing. Um, it's not really going to be feasible. And I don't think that it's necessary, like I said, with the decrease, um, uh, decrease in exposure outside exercising anyway. So some of the ones to, that I would avoid, a single layer bandana did not show all that much benefit in, in one study. Some of these knitted and crocheted ones, I mean, the crocheted is like the protest mask um, that, has, that doesn't block anything. Um, so that's not going to be helpful. Um, the valved masks that don't uh, don't impede airflow out um, is not going to provide protection. If you're infected, you're blowing all your air out and not protecting the people around you. Um, and then basically in general, if it's a, a thin mask that you can kind of see through, you can hold it up and see light through it, it's not going to provide as much protection. There was uh, some controversy regarding neck gaiters. You may have seen some of the articles in, in you know, CNN or in the press. Um, so this came from a study from Duke that was really not actually testing mask efficacy per se. It was testing the, the way that he was testing masks. So uh, using, uh, it was a cheap way to do it using I think an iPhone and a laser. Um, and they just use various types of masks. And one, the neck gaiter that they used for that test was a thin single layer um, neck gaiter uh, that did not show any real benefit in decreasing um, particle transmission. It actually paradoxically showed, uh, had higher number of particles, which didn't really make any sense. And there's some been, uh, you know, up other um, research after that by Virginia Tech and some other people um, that, uh, that kind of dispelled this. So I think that neck gaiters are probably okay. Um, better if they're multiple layers. And these are actually pretty popular among runners and cyclists because they can, they can wear it around their neck. Um, and then if they come into a crowd or, you know, uh, stop at a stoplight and other, a lot of people are around, then, um, you can basically pull it up quickly and, and sort of protect yourself and protect other people from you. So um, I think it's a, a decent option um, for, uh, uh, for exercising out, outside. Um, so next thing that comes up a lot in, in cycling, obviously, especially when we're talking about restarting group rides is, is drafting. And there is another um, 
I wouldn't say a research study, it was a preprint that came out um, that I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, regarding um, aerodynamics and, and viral particles uh, or and particle spread. So this was not a virus study. This was a, an aerodynamic study where they basically um, created droplets of certain sizes um, by spraying into a wind tunnel and, um, and then showing, depending on the speed of the, of the wind, um, in the wind tunnel where these particles went. So what it doesn't tell you is if you are this person standing behind the other um, in the draft, whether or not you're actually getting a sufficient viral load um, with that to cause an infection. Being outside in the air, in the dispersion with wind, um, it's purely looking at where the particles are going. But what it tells us is that, um, that the particles go straight back, essentially. When you're you know, in your slipstream, there is a, there's a reason why you feel that, that draft um, and it's easier when you're riding behind somebody else. Um, and so in regards to, um, to staying away from somebody's respiratory particles, especially if they're coughing or sneezing, which they really shouldn't be having symptoms and being on a ride with people and coughing on them. Um, but uh, it's better to be side by side because then you're not in their slipstream. Those particles are going backwards and that is gonna be safer than drafting. The optimal distance behind somebody is, um, is a little unclear. Um, we do know that you're, if you're really safe behind them, you're probably not going to get a benefit of the draft. Um, so it kind of defeats the purpose of drafting in cycling. Um, USA Cycling, uh, in their recommendations, said 20 feet. Um, this paper said more like 10 meters um, or 30 something feet. So um, um, that exact number is a little unclear. And this, again, was not really a virus study. Um, what would be interesting, I suppose, although unfortunate, would be if some of the riders in the tour started testing positive, and then you could test to see if the people that were on their wheel tested positive later. I hope that doesn't happen. We'll talk about the tour in a bit. So the safest thing that you can do um, for, in terms of uh, of continuing to, to ride is to stay home. Um, and thankfully, the uh, technology has gotten a lot better um, so that staying home and, and riding in your living room is actually a little more enjoyable than it used to be. So uh, before we just had sort of, you know, the rollers or um, the, uh, the standard fluid or a, or a magnetic um, wheel on trader, like the one in the bottom middle here. Um, but now we have uh, direct drive trainers, um, Wahoo, Tax, Cyclops, um, and, uh, and others. Um, and so you hook your, you know, you take your back wheel off and hook directly into the trainer and it modulates the resistance um, so that it uh, can feel very much real. You also have the full bikes um, and the Peloton setup so you can do your basically a spin class uh, in your, your living room as well. So you have a lot of these um, options and then a bunch of options for different apps to go along with that. So, um, you know, not only Zwift and Peloton, but, um, but all these other ones, a lot of them have real um, GoPro video around the world um, that you can essentially ride virtually. And if you have one of those smart trainers, then it will modulate the resistance as you're going up the, the hill to make it harder and you have to change gears and do all that as if you're as if you're riding on the road. So a lot of new options out there, a lot of fun racing uh, on, on Zwift um, and, and Train Road and Sufferfest and all the other ones. So um, I think that uh, even if you're just staying indoors, you have you have some good options these days. Um, the next option then would be riding outdoors, but riding solo. So you are very low risk of, of getting infected, um, especially if you're out in the middle of nowhere like this guy, but you do have some safety concerns of, um, you know, get double flat tire or get hit by a car and, and nobody else is around. So, um, you know, riding with, uh, 
with your safety beacon on or um, having somebody know where you are, uh, a road ID or a medical bracelet so that people can look up your, your medical information is all really helpful um, if, you're, if you're out riding solo. Um, and then there's riding with other people. And so there is this concept, uh, it's come out with uh, this quarantine where you have a, a group of riders that you're essentially creating a bubble with. Um, so the smaller that group is, um, and if you can really trust the people who are in the, this group with you, then the safer it is for you. Um, the size, the number of people that you're riding with is up to you. Obviously the tour has created a bubble of 176 riders, but um, for us, since we're not really in a true bubble, a true bubble um, probably should be less than five or so. Um, and you want to make sure that there are people who are also adhering to all the recommendations and trying to stay safe when they're not on the bike as well um, with limited interactions outside of your group. So um, as much as I would love to ride with all of you, I'm probably not the best choice since I work in a hospital and I see COVID patients all the time. Um, I'm going to be at higher risk no matter what of, of getting infected and, and spreading it. So find someone to ride with who's also working from home um, or, or something like that. Um, so with, with group rides, you're basically talking about one of these quarantines, but, but getting bigger and the risk is going to go up with larger group rides. Um, so the, the probability that somebody in that group has uh, come in contact and has the virus, they may be either asymptomatic or what we call pre-symptomatic, so they, they will develop symptoms in a few days, but haven't yet. Um, and uh, as you increase the number of people, you're gonna increase the risk of that happening. Um, so if you are personally at higher risk um, of contracting the virus or higher risk for, if you, uh, higher risk to get complications if you got it, then you should probably avoid this. And large group rides with people that you don't know, really not recommended in areas with high incidence of, of COVID-19. Um, this was one of the statements from USA Cycling. And um, I would say that we, California, especially Southern California and LA County and Ventura County are probably still in this high incidence uh, area. We're still on the either the red list or the purple list um, of, uh, of the counties. Um, and so, um, we is, you know, we should be avoiding, I think at this point, still group rides. And I think most of the groups, um, that I invited here ha are still, um, are still not doing the, the standard group rides. Um, I, you know, the LaGrange Nichols ride is one of my favorites, but I don't think that that's happening right now. Um, and so, um, but the smaller, the, the better, I think. Um, so if you, if you do go out with, uh, with other people and you're riding with other people, um, I would bring a, a mask. Um, I would bring, you can bring two actually, because when they get wet and grim, grimy, they are less effective. Um, and at least have something so that when you're meeting up in the beginning, you can wear a mask before you get out and get riding. Um, and then if you have to stop for water or coffee or whatever, uh, you have something um, to put on. Um, even if you're not wearing it while you're riding. Like I said, riding side by side is gonna be uh, safer than, um, than riding behind and drafting. But if you are riding behind, try to space it out. And then um, you know, don't ride if you're having symptoms. And if you do feel the need to sneeze or cough or clear your nose, then pull off to the back and, and don't do it with anybody behind you. Um, don't share any water bottles or food that goes back to the fomites and, and direct transmission. And then you can bring potentially or have somebody have a, a small bottle of hand sanitizer that you could put on if you're gonna stop for, uh, um, for a meal afterwards before you eat. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, professional cycling because um, it's been kind of interesting seeing what they're doing and, um, and how it's worked out so far. So the UCI put out um, these, uh, this paper in July, talking about reopening the, the cycling season. Um, and started off with 
uh, assessing the, the risk of the area that you're going to do the event in. So um, USA Cycling also adopted this, <clears throat> this same risk model that was in um, the UCI report. Um, so initially, the first question is, can you have mass gatherings and are you able to get the required permits and permissions? So um, in uh, California, we still can't really have mass gatherings, um, but I'll, I'll go over some of the events that are still able to take place um, in the area. So if you can do it, um, then you look at the specific region. Is this gonna be an event in multiple venues and cities uh, like the tour where you're traveling. Um, and then uh, looking at the, the athletes and participants and where they're coming from, is there a lot of travel to the event? Um, are any of them at, gonna be at higher risk? Do you have a mass start or is it, and then is it a indoor you know, track event? Um, these are all sort of the risk scores and the more points you get on this, the higher the risk of the, of the event. So this is what the, the cycling coordinators who are trying to decide whether or not they can put on an event. These, this is what they have to sort of look at to see if it's safe to do so. So locally, a lot of the events that we had scheduled this fall have been canceled, all the gray ones that are, that are crossed out. A lot of the other ones have gone virtual, like the Sea Otter Classic that's going on right now, the Santa Barbara 100, Phil's Cookie Fondo, the Mike Nosco Memorial Ride, those have all basically converted to virtual ones this year. Um, some of the, you know, the century rides uh, are still going on, but those are sort of staggered chip starts from what I understand. So it's not a mass start. Um, and so I believe those are all still uh, happening according to their websites. And then a couple of the mountain bike championships uh, up at Big Bear appear to still be on, but most other things it looks like are, are still canceled. Um, but USA Cycling is giving permits uh, as long as you uh, meet certain requirements and follow the rules. Um, and very few of the events seem to have been able to do that and are, are comfortable uh, proceeding with, with the race or the ride. Um, worldwide, the tour schedule is in full swing. Um, so the women's uh, Giro is starting tomorrow. Um, and I heard that they're gonna have a, a Tour de France a women's tour de France in 2022, which I'm excited about. Um, Perry Roubaix is a new addition for the women's uh, world tour this year as well. Um, and then their Vuelta is in November. So um, in the, uh, the men's side, uh, we've already gone through uh, the top four there. And then we're obviously right in the middle of the, of the tour. They really stacked the, the uh, schedule um, back to back to back um, with the, the tour, the world championships, and then the Giro. Um, it's a very condensed race season. Um, and then the Giro and the Vuelta actually overlap. So the teams are kind of deciding who to send people to. Um, I know Ineos has uh, Egan Bernal riding the, the tour. And then Chris Froome is riding uh, the Vuelta. And uh, Garrett Thomas is riding uh, the Giro. So kind of, uh, since you can't do all three this year, people are, teams are sort of splitting up. Um, and and the, the riders themselves are also sort of deciding which places to go to. So I know um, to try to minimize travel to other countries in, in COVID, for example, um, Nibali basically decided to only race in Italy this year. So he, he's not doing the tour um, and he's doing, uh, I believe the Giro and the, I'm not sure about the world championships that got moved to Italy. Um, but he's basically just racing there. That was his choice. So um, that's what sort of the teams are, are doing. So in order to put on these events, they have to have a COVID-19 coordinator that um, is an expert in infectious diseases and communicates with all the teams and the regional health authorities, making sure that they're following um, the local regulations. And then all of the, that person also supervises all of the cleaning protocols of the hotels where everyone's staying and and all the, um, the regulations for them. So the teams are putting together uh, these bubbles that are uh, include obviously the riders, but also all of the support staff, um, which is quite a few people for each team. Um, now, uh, and then the teams are basically isolated throughout the whole 
tour when they're not on the bike together. So there's no mingling between teams outside of the race. Um, they have separate dining rooms. Uh, some of the teams even have their, their staff separated from the riders. Um, and then we'll talk about the PCR testing procedures that they're, that they're doing. And then just during the races, the teams then link up to form a Peloton bubble. So um, I will say that, you know, this, this bubble is obviously not as secure as um, like the NBA bubble where everyone is at, you know, Disney World, well, Disney World in Florida, they're all in one place, they can't leave. Uh, and people who do violate it, like one guy got an Uber Eats delivery, he got quarantined for 10 days, uh, just for getting an Uber Eats and having some contact with the outside world. The NBA is also, from what I understand, testing every day. They're getting superficial nasal swabs and, and oral swabs every day. So um, that's different than what they're doing in, in cycling and in the tour, um, not testing nearly as much. And they're obviously traveling to different places and near the fans and other spectators, which are not present in, in any other sport, basically. You know, the US Open doesn't have any fans right now. NBA, hockey, everybody uh, has no fans. So that's um, playing with a, a different uh, type of sport here. Um, so the, the testing that the, all the riders are doing, if it's a single day race, they have to get two tests before the race, um, about six days before and then three days before. If they're doing multiple races, they still have to do those two tests, but then they have to do another test um, if another race is at least 10 days later. And then in the tour, they ha all had to do two tests prior to coming into the tour. And then, um, well, that might be, oh, so um, yeah, if they, um, uh, so sorry, in the tour, um, they all had to be tested uh, on this past Monday in the rest day. Um, in a three week stage race, they have to be tested after 10 days. Um, and then if two races are spread out um, by 14 days, then uh, for that second race, they again have to get two tests. So that's their um, testing policy um, for these. In addition, they have to get symptom questionnaires every day, uh, starting five days before the race and every day of racing, including the, the rest days. Um, and if they meet enough points on here, then they have to get a PCR test. And um, they have, the tour has a mobile testing lab that they can run tests very quickly um, as they're traveling around France. So we have had some positive test results. Um, before the Vuelta of Burgos, um, there was a rider from Israel Startup Nation that tested positive and, and two of his teammates also was, were pulled from the race. Um, Sylvain Delier here tested positive before the Strada Bianchi and got pulled out along with a few of uh, UAE's team um, were pulled. And then interestingly, Hugo Huli uh, on Astana had a, a positive test, but then had subsequent multiple negative I think it might have been a false positive. So he's actually, um, I believe, racing in, in the tour. He was cleared to come back. Um, I was really interested on Monday what was going to happen, uh, where they tested 841 people, all the riders and support staff. And of everybody who was tested, uh, there were five positive tests, uh, four staff members, on one on each of those teams, uh, and then Funny enough, the race director himself, Christian Prudomi, uh, tested positive. Uh, he was also in the VIP car with the Prime Minister of France, um, who is now quarantined um, for, for being in contact with him. So he's uh, quarantining, Christian is quarantining at home. The assistant race director is, is starting the race every day now. Um, but uh, they have a rule now that two positive tests within seven days and the whole team is out. So that's gonna be interesting for Ineos, Michelton Scott, Kofidis and AG2R. If any of, any of their other either riders or staff members test positive in the next seven days, then uh, those are some big riders that are gonna get kicked out, um, maybe through no fault of their own. So they're all on edge right now. And I think they're all very happy that none of the riders tested positive on Monday. Um, so 
the podium etiquette is going to be a little bit different this year. So obviously no uh, kissing of the winners and no podium girls. Um, they actually this year, uh, and I think for all future races, have, have gotten rid of this entirely. And it'll be one male and one female uh, VIP presenter to present all of the um, all of the um, awards uh, and to the winners. So instead, they're uh, all wearing masks. Um, the podium blocks are spread, supposed to be one, one and a half meters apart. You're not supposed to touch other riders. And then the number of photographers and spectators, everybody at the ceremonies are, uh, are limited. I did see some pictures from some of the earlier races and they were spraying champagne. So apparently that is still allowed. Um, and then there's the spectator etiquette, which has been concerning to me. And a lot of the writers were reaching out on Twitter. Um, special thanks to Ashley and Jared Gruber for some of these pictures. Uh, they're over there shooting the tour right now and, and were nice enough to send me these. Um, but uh, on the Pyrenees climbs, if you're watching, you know, part of the tour is on the climbs, everyone's bunching up and yelling at the riders and getting in their face. And unfortunately, people were still actually doing that this year. Um, a lot of people were wearing masks, but not everybody. And, you know, in this picture, you got the, the kid who's not wearing a mask. The, his father underneath him is uh, just doing the mouth thing with the nose exposed. And then the guy on the left is doing the chin guard mask, which, you know, doesn't help at all. So um, there's, uh, there was a lot of concern because this was a couple days prior to all, all the riders getting tested when everybody was really bunching up on the climbs, um, not social distancing. And uh, I was afraid that some of these riders were gonna, were gonna test positive. So we'll, we'll see to come. Um, if that has any any effect. So um, for all of us, if, um, if you do get COVID, then initially isolate yourself. If you can isolate yourself from the other people that you're living with, your family members, um, and you, uh, you will be um, notified from public health for contact tracing, and you should let people around you know. Um, and do not exercise. If you test positive, if you get sick with COVID, you really should not exercise for at least two weeks. Um, we'll kind of go into more details on that. But there's this, uh, you know, thought, um, you know, wives tale uh, of this neck check that if, if you're ill, but it's all above the neck, um, like congestion, that you're okay to keep exercising. Um, and if there's anything below the neck, then you should not exercise. Well, COVID-19 affects the entire body. So even if you just have sniffles, um, it's, it does affect the entire body because of, of where the virus attaches and, and enters the cells. And um, so I really would not recommend, even with mild symptoms, for at least two weeks. Um, so some of the effects obviously you know, affects the lungs and pneumonia. Um, so a chest x-ray on the right, and then several uh, CAT scans on the left. Uh, it tends to form these patchy infiltrates. These we call ground glass opacities. It looks like stained glass in the in the lungs. Um, and it can be pretty mild like the top right or very, very severe like the bottom left. Um, and be very hard to get oxygen in to, into the body. In addition, um, we've seen that it increases your risk of forming blood clots. So um, both microscopic blood clots and large ones like pulmonary embolism here in the CAT scan, this large dark um, object shouldn't be there in the pulmonary artery. Um, and this has been a, a, a source of some of the deaths in COVID, including young, otherwise healthy people having blood clots that form uh, embolisms, pulmonary embolisms, strokes, or heart attacks. Um, and I don't think that cyclists are immune to these. Uh, you may remember Chris Horner, who I saw back here. Um, Chris Horner had a blood clot, I think after a couple stages after this one in 2011, after he crashed. So we, uh, we do get uh, blood clots sometimes. And, um, and so we want to avoid that. In addition, um, one of high interest to me, obviously as a cardiologist, is the risk of myocarditis. So myocarditis is an inflammation of heart muscle cells is most commonly from a, a viral infection. Um, and if you're exercising, 
while you have myocarditis or inflammation in the heart, then it actually causes an acceleration of that, an increase in viral replication, and an increase in cell death, scar formation, and abnormal heart rhythms. So um, this is part of the, um, the reason to really make sure that you stop exercise. And we'll talk about looking for the uh, myocarditis and who might be at risk for that. Historically, um, this does account for a decent number of the sudden cardiac deaths in young people, in addition to some of the other congenital abnormalities um, like long QT syndrome or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or other cardiomyopathies like that. Um, and this has happened already. So Eduardo Rodriguez um, was out for the season because uh, he got myocarditis after COVID. And so he's resting for probably at least uh, you know, six months or so. So the, there was another um, article that came out in July. Um, and I wanted to go into it in a little bit of detail with some caveats. So it was a small study. It was 100 patients in Germany. Um, average age was 49 years. Uh, so relatively you know, pretty young people, um, about 20% were smokers, about 20% had high blood pressure, about 20% had diabetes. So um, overall, not a high risk population. And they didn't all get bad COVID. So about two thirds of them were at home, only a third were hospitalized. Uh, 18 of them were asymptomatic, had no symptoms, and 49 about half of them had you know, minor or, or uh, moderate symptoms. And so, um, you know, these are not just the sickest of the sick. People who had cardiac symptoms and were got an, a cardiac MRI for that reason were not included. So um, these were just basically screening MRIs. And they were about two to three months after the diagnosis of COVID. So allowing some time for resolution, uh, this was the mean uh, or the median time um, between diagnosis and getting the MRI study. And what they found was that a large proportion of them, uh, 78 out of 100, had some abnormalities seen on cardiac MRI. 60 of them uh, had what they called ongoing inflammation with, with uh, abnormal findings on the MRI. And 32 actually had evidence of scar formation. So these are sort of um, you know, the scar is what myocarditis can develop and is higher risk later for, for complications. Um, and then 22 had inflammation around the heart in the sac, something called pericarditis or pericardial inflammation. Um, now, um, 71 also had um, abnormalities in the blood test that I'm going to talk about in some of the, these protocols with a high sensitivity troponin T level. Um, and then when you compared them to healthy controls or controls, other people that had similar risk factors, like I mentioned with diabetes and hypertension and coronary disease, it was still a much greater prevalence of, of MRI abnormalities compared to the COVID patients. So um, the, the caveats to, the, to this is that um, you know, with these abnormalities on the MRI, we don't know how much that actually uh, corresponds to clinically significant myocarditis. Uh, like, do we need to rest all of these people who had no symptoms, did not have cardiac arrhythmias or, or um, chest pain or trouble breathing or anything? Um, do they need to rest for three to six months? And um, I don't think we, that we know that. We, I don't know, you know, uh, the extent of these abnormalities on the MRIs, maybe some of them were really mild abnormalities, but they counted it for the study. Um, so I think we need more information um, than this. The other thing we don't know is, you know, does this apply to, um, you know, for example, when we're restarting college athletics, does this apply to young, healthy college athletes? Um, are, you know, they probably won't have the same amount of of uh, myocarditis, but we just don't, we don't know. Um, this is also a very, uh, we're very young in the time course of this virus. Um, you know, with influenza and other viruses, we know 
10 years out, we know the long-term implications um, of these viruses, um, even if they have you know, myocarditis from, from them. Uh, we've only known about this virus for now the last nine or 10 months. So we don't know the long-term implications of, of getting COVID. Um, and that's part of, I think, what's scary to people uh, is that um, we don't know we don't know the long-term effects of it. So, um, but uh, we do know that if um, you are diagnosed with myocarditis, especially, um, I think some of the with symptoms, um, then the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology restrict exercise for three to six months um, and kind of wait till the resolution of inflammation and do further testing um, <clears throat> at that point to see if it is safe to resume exercise. Uh, and this is really, really stopping exercise, doing walking only and really nothing more, more intense than, than that, um, especially in the early stages while there's active inflammation going on because it'll, it'll worsen it and, and worsen your recovery. Um, so um, they came out with, uh, with some guidelines for returning to exercise um, in, in COVID and after COVID, and we'll uh, break this up and kind of go into it into some more detail. These were, these were published in May, so there are going to be updates coming soon. Um, I spoke on, on Twitter to a couple of the, um, the leading sports cardiologists in the country, and they are working on sort of some updates to this, uh, but they haven't come out yet. So this is what we have right now. So if you're COVID-19 negative, maybe you just had a contact with somebody, but you never actually tested positive yourself, you never had symptoms, no limitations to exercise, continue to follow your social distancing guidelines and wearing masks and everything that we were talking about, um, and just um, monitor for symptoms and, and get tested if needed. If you were positive, uh, but you didn't have any symptoms, you had a screening test that was positive, but you never had symptoms, then still rest, absolutely no exercise for two weeks and look for, for those symptoms. You know, we see, um, we see people who, uh, you know, initially don't have symptoms and then seven or eight days later, they kind of decompensate and, and end up in the hospital or end up, or they're in the, in the hospital with very, very mild symptoms. And then seven or eight days later, they decompensate and end up on a ventilator. So, um, you really have to kind of watch things for, for a couple weeks. If you have mild symptoms, but you're not hospitalized, again, rest uh, with no exercise. And it's now two weeks after your symptoms have resolved. So this may end up being four weeks or six weeks um, that you're, you're waiting out and, and not exercising for. Um, and then I would, you know, if you're, especially if you're doing high level cycling, running, um, intervals, stuff like that, um, would see a medical professional, come see us. Um, and some of the things that we'll be looking at is this high sensitivity, high sensitivity troponin, uh, this blood test, um, an EKG, maybe an ultrasound of your heart, an echocardiogram. Um, and if those are all normal, then, um, starting slow with resuming exercise and kind of gradually going up for there uh, and monitoring yourself for, for more symptoms or, or worsening. If some of these tests are, are abnormal, then um, we would potentially consider that myocarditis um, and follow those guidelines, which is more like three to six months. Um, if you do have significant symptoms that require hospitalization, then um, again, in the hospital, they're going to be probably testing your troponin, doing echocardiogram, another imaging testing, and <clears throat> similar kind of thing. If those are abnormal, following the myocarditis guidelines, if those are normal, then resting for two weeks after symptoms resolve and doing those testings um, to... Um, uh, to see if you're safe to resume exercise under your doctor's guidance. So at UCLA, um, we're essentially following this. These came out um, in August, though. So we added 
cardiac MRI imaging as well. So um, if you were in the hospital and you had abnormal troponins, heart rhythm issues, heart failure, or have any concerning cardiac symptoms, then we will be testing your labs, including that troponin, a heart failure marker called BNP, and then inflammatory markers called ESR or SED rate and CRP. Um, we'll probably order a, um, a two-week patch to look for abnormal heart rhythm. Um, and if, in, if you have any of those abnormal rhythms, those are concerning for inflammation of the heart or myocarditis. And we would potentially do a, a cardiac MRI in that case. Also, if the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart is abnormal, um, we would proceed with the cardiac MRI. And then before you really get back into um, strenuous exercise testing, after you've had a significant um, COVID illness, um, I would want to see you on an exercise treadmill test to see if it's safe to do that. If it's not, um, if any of these are, are abnormal, <clears throat> especially the cardiac MRI, um, then it would be more like three to six months again for, for uh, myocarditis. So in uh, conclusion, then I'll get to some of the questions that um, are on the, uh, the chat here. Um, so COVID-19, I think, um, spreads mostly by respiratory droplets, and especially when we're outside on the bike, uh, touching, you know, fomites and handles and that kind of stuff is probably not as much of an issue. And aerosol, aerosolization is also not as much of an issue because you are outside and the air is not really lingering as you're riding along. So, um, you know, in, in all of your uh, life and, and uh, everything, washing your, your hands, doing your social distancing and wearing a proper mask, like I was, I was talking about the types of masks, um, we'll try to keep you safe. To decrease your risk when you are cycling, either ride indoors, ride solo, or with a small quarantine of other people who you trust or either in, you know, living with you or in your bubble and who are also being safe. Do not ride if you are feeling sick. Go ahead and isolate yourself and talk to your, your primary doctor about getting tested. Rest an additional two weeks after you recover from uh, your illness, and then I would talk to your doctor about getting blood tests and potentially, um, you know, cardiac imaging or, or stress testing before you restart heavy exercise um, and, and rhythm monitoring um, before you resume exercise. So um, some of the additional resources, uh, the UCLA Sports Cardiology um, website there, we're here to help you. Um, the USA Cycling website has uh, a whole page on COVID-19 resources, um, has a, a similar Zoom webinar video um, that was interesting on there as well. Um, and talk about, for those of you, um, you know, or interested in organizing events, um, has all of the, the rules and regulations for whether or not you can put on an event. Um, and then cdc.gov uh, obviously has uh, continually updating guidelines on um, on uh, social distancing and mask wearing and everything and testing. So um, some of the questions that we uh, we can get to. Um, Brady mentioned Timothy. If relevant, is there any difference in catching the illness via the nose versus the mouth? Um, I don't think so. I mean, in the in the nose, you have um, you have a little bit more filtering of the air going in, so the the viral particles. Um, this is sort of a, a viral immunology sort of question um, that I'm not as much of an expert on. But these smaller particles, um, like in aerosolized infections, are able to pass through the nose and and get deeper into the lungs, um, and then the larger respiratory particles tend to get trapped in the nose um, and, and cause more of an upper respiratory illness, or at least starting as an upper respiratory illness. Um, we, will, we will let everybody know we're, we are recording this um, and uh, we'll try to uh, figure out where we're posting it, um, I think on, um, on a link off of the UCLA um, cardiology website. So, um, Interesting about the 
Freakonomics. Thank you. I'll take a look at that. I am curious to hear what all of the different professional sports are doing because they all seem to be doing different things. Um, and uh, it's worked out so far with, uh, with cycling, even with um, not as secure of a bubble. Um, Major League Baseball has had more, um, more infections and more outbreaks than, um, than NBA and NHL. Um, let's see, any ideas about outcomes post-COVID for these athletes? Let me see. Oh, <laughs> so um, I don't think, so we don't know. Um, so the question is, ideas about outcomes post-COVID for these athletes, are the symptoms less severe, um, cardiac involvement? I don't think we know the answer to this, um, whether or not, you know, definitely um, people with less, uh, with, with higher comorbidities are getting more severe infections and, and most of the um, most of the deaths, I think, are in people who are older and have more comorbid comorbidities. So um, I think that athletes are going to be probably at lower risk of severe infections. Um, but we do have um, some other people who have gotten infected who have no comorbidities or relatively young and have ended up with very severe infections on ventilators and stuff. So um, I'm hoping that we are, are healthier and safer. Um, was it right for Sagan to be DQ'd for aggressive sprinting? This was, there was a really good discussion on the Move podcast with with Lance and and uh, George Hincampi and Johan Bernil about this. Um, I think uh, that they're more um, aggressive. The the judges are more aggressive in trying to be safer uh, for the tour these days. So I, I it was a pretty aggressive move, and, and I think it was actually right for him to be uh, disqualified from from that stage so i don't want him to get kicked out of the tour but he deserved a little punishment for that move um dangers of breathing inside mass so um this is what regarding the the carbon dioxide and recirculating the air um the you know i don't think that um I don't think that there's any risk in terms of oxygenation of getting oxygen in. It's, it is uncomfortable when you're wearing the mask, but I think that you're um, able to, to get enough oxygen in. And, and I think that um, I wouldn't wear a mask during strenuous activity. I try to stay away from people and, and not wear it um, during that. When we're doing our treadmill tests, we allow the, the patients to take off their masks um, when they're uh, when they're on the treadmill so that we allow them to, to breathe deeply and, and get to peak exercise. We also COVID test them before they come in to, to get the treadmills. So um, I think that I don't know of any um, data on, on you know, carbon dioxide and wearing the cloth masks. Um, I wear a mask all day in the hospital and, and um, and uh, I, I don't think that it affects my carbon dioxide levels. So, um, can COVID enter through the eyes? So, um, it it can enter through the eyes. We think that this is a pretty rare route for infection, though. Probably more so if you're rubbing your eyes and really getting a higher dose in it. Um, and outdoors, I don't think that this is a big issue. I wear glasses sunglasses anyway when I'm riding um, to protect against other things getting in my eyes and bugs and stuff. Um, and, and uh, you know, when I'm riding, I, I like to have that, but um, I don't think that it's much of a risk for COVID entering while you're, while you're riding. Um, is there anything you can change in your diet to help decrease your risk? Um, I don't think so. Um, so I, you know, I recommend a Mediterranean diet, um, to all my patients anyway, uh, high in fish and omega-3 fatty acids, avocados, olive oil. We have really good, um, things of all of that up in, in Ventura County and, and LA. Um, but, uh, I don't think that it necessarily helps with, uh, decreasing your, your risk, um, in this aspect. Um, <clears throat> 
Jose, whatever. John Scully, I don't know if I understand the question. How is a polypro mask different from a neck gaiter? Um, it doubled over, which wicks sweat at least. So, you know, I, I think that um, that the neck gaiter is is probably okay, especially if it's doubled up, it's multiple layers. I think that you're you're gonna get some filtering um, and it's very similar to to a double layer mask in that case. Um, one thing that I I didn't really mention with the masks is that um, you want to try to avoid touching your face. Um, and in some cases, as I touch my face, um, in some cases, uh, wearing the masks seem to increase the amount that people are touching their face if it's not fitted well, <clears throat> and they're constantly adjusting it, holding it to, to talk, to breathe easier, and that kind of stuff. You know, I don't think that that, that basically defeats the purpose of the mask and, and makes it less useful. So um, if, uh, if you have something that fits well, um, covers, uh, covers your, your mouth and your nose, and you're not um, fiddling with it, and it's a couple layers, then I think it's gonna give you some benefit. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the neck gaiters have um, the advantage, basically just that you can wear it and easily pull it up without um, fiddling and, and getting it out of your pocket and that kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> despite that one study, I do think that they uh, can, be, can be helpful and useful. Um, Description. Hmm. So descriptions of the levels of symptoms mentioned from mild to severe. Um, there, I don't think there's actually a standard. And actually, some of the um, <clears throat> the tests that were done, or the the studies that were looked at in Europe, um, they actually had different sort of definitions for what was considered a moderate COVID illness. And uh, I think severe, sort of, you know, people. Um, understand as, as being hospitalized or having low oxygen. Um, and, but I don't think that there's a, a standardized description of what, you know, mild and, and moderate. Um, so um, I think this, it's sort of a gray area, a, a gradient across the board for that. Um, what currently is the most accurate way to get tested for COVID? Do you believe people who don't have symptoms should be tested, and how accurate is the antibody test? All right, all very good questions. So, um, the you know the most accurate way <clears throat> I think that we still have is is the PCR test um, with the deep nasopharyngeal swab. Um, it's not a pleasant test. I've I've had it done three times, thankfully all negative, um, but they really get pretty far back there. Um, the, the problem with this test is that it tests you and, and your nasopharynx at that time. So if you don't have viral particles in your nose at that time, then it's gonna be negative. Um, and it doesn't tell you what you had a week ago and it doesn't tell you a week from now or even a couple of days from now, you could get infected theoretically walking out of the testing site um, and, uh, and get it a little bit later. So um, it is accurate for what it is at that time, whether or not you have particles in your nose. Some of the other ways that they're testing, um, like in the mouth or uh, superficial nose, probably have a little bit lower sensitivity, um, but, um, but I think they're still useful. And if it is a positive test, the, I think that the there have been some reports of false positives, but overall, I think that that's probably pretty rare uh, relative to how many tests we're doing. Um, <clears throat> the um, people who do not have symptoms, should they be tested, is sort of an epidemiology question and contact tracing. And it's, that's a, um, I'd have to, I think, defer to, um, to the epidemiology experts. Um, I think CDC guidelines right now recently changed to not recommend for asymptomatic people. Um, but if you can find the, um, you know, if you can do contact tracing and find people before they start spreading it, before they start get symptoms, then, um, then you can get a better hold over the outbreak. 
Uh, at this point, the outbreak is so widespread that that's not really possible to do on a nationwide level, though. Um, we're kind of beyond the point where we could control it with solely contact tracing with a few cases. But that's essentially what they're doing, you know, in the NBA bubble and in, um, in uh, you know, the tour bubble, because they have a controlled population of 841 people that they tested and and they can get people before they're having symptoms and really control the outbreak. So it is possible in those settings, but I don't think it's potentially, it's really possible on a nationwide level to control it at this point with that. The antibody test um, <clears throat> is, uh, is of great interest right now. Um, and there's probably very few people that will really benefit from the antibody test. Um, we think that the antibodies, um, the levels of them will probably uh, decrease over a time period of maybe three months. We don't know exactly, but the, the antibody levels are going to decrease. Um, and that doesn't tell you everything about immunity. So there are other forms of the immune system with uh, memory B cells and T cells that that can be reactivated and fight an infection. So it's not all about the circulating antibodies. Um, and if you got a test now and it was negative, um, you, it doesn't mean that you, you, know, you could have had an infection in March and um, then those antibodies have waned by now. So um, it really tests, I think, fairly recently. It also doesn't test at least the IgG antibodies doesn't test if you currently have an infection because it takes some time for those antibodies to be positive. So the PCR test is more useful for testing if you are currently infected. The antibody tests if you had a prior infection in the recent last few months probably. Um, so um, the strenuous exercise increase our vulnerability to COVID in the hours and days after um, yeah, so I think that it's, um, we don't know for sure uh, whether or not these high level strenuous exercises increases your vulnerability to COVID, but it seems like with prior viruses that, um, that it may, um, that, that yes, you may be a little bit more susceptible after a marathon or, or a very strenuous exercise bout. Um, like I was talking about before. So, but um, regular moderate exercise um, is going to improve your immune system and, and may help with, um, with your susceptibility. So, um, symptoms of myocarditis from mild to severe. So, um, you know, myocarditis is, is a, like I said, an inflammation of the heart. It, generally causes um, chest pain. It can cause abnormal heart rhythms, uh, arrhythmias. Um, and uh, it can show up on echocardiogram or ultrasound as uh, the wall, uh, the, the heart not functioning properly. So either a portion of the heart wall not moving um, or the entire heart um, having a decreased uh, decreased function, something called the ejection fraction. Um, normal ejection fraction, the amount of blood that your heart pumps out every beat is more than 55%. Um, and so you may see a global decrease in that so that it's only pumping out, you know, 20 or 30% of the blood on every beat. Um, so th that would be, a, you know, a very severe form of myocarditis. Um, and um, early warning signs, symptoms of this is essentially um, probably chest pain, palpitations, um, and, and trouble breathing, um, and maybe just a generalized uh, fatigue, um, which some people are seeing after, after a COVID illness. They just, even a very prolonged course of, of fatigue and, and um, trouble breathing, um, whether or not that's from the lungs recovering or from the heart would need further testing, I think. Um, so pretty early still, C could you be a carrier without symptoms? Um, yes. So we, we have seen, um, um, 
or do you mean so so um you can have the infection and not have any symptoms we've seen asymptomatic transmission we've also seen pre-symptomatic transmission where you're infectious and you can spread it to other people but you don't develop symptoms for another few days um and so um that uh, that definitely happens um <clears throat> whether or not you can be a, a chronic carrier uh, like typhoid Mary and, and just continue to spread it to other people? I don't think so. Um, there's been some interest in people who continue to test positive for um, you know, weeks or months, um, and they continue to have uh, you know, viral particles in their, in their nose and are testing positive. Um, that may be just a <clears throat> very high sensitivity of the PCR test itself that it's, it's so sensitive that it's picking up particle, you know, viral fragments that aren't actually able to cause infection, but do still test positive on the, on the test. So we are, um, I was talking to my colleague about uh, a patient uh, today who's a month out, still testing positive, um, and whether or not to, because um, we need to, to bring them in for other uh, other testing, uh, whether or not they're still infectious, and the symptoms have gone away, so they probably are not still infectious, and it's just the viral particles that are still popping up um, on the test. Uh, whether or not you can get infected again, have a, a full, you know, repeat COVID infection, if your immunity wanes, um, there's been, uh, at this point, a couple case reports of this happening, um, and, um, so it's, it's probably possible, but it's so young in the illness that this has been around, you know, nine months again, um, that we just don't, don't know how long immunity lasts. Um, and it's something we are all interested in and, um, in, and in regard to the vaccines as well, you know, is this going to be something like the, the flu vaccine where we're going to need vaccines uh, you know, a booster every year for coronavirus, or um, is uh, or is you know one vaccine or or a two vaccine series going to be enough? Um, I, I don't think that we know. So that would be, I think, what we would need to quote unquote return to normal life, um, like Joe asked here. Um, I think that I'm, we're all hoping for the vaccine to come out soon, um, but I'm not holding my breath for that. Uh, these phase three trials in order to really do it properly and safely are long trials. Usually it's a couple years. Um, prior to this, the, the fastest vaccine that came out was I believe for mumps and it was four years for them to, to do all the testing and to start producing and come out with the vaccine. That was the fastest one. Um, and so, trying to get one out in, you know, in the next couple months will be, um, I, I don't really know how that's going to happen and, and do a full phase three trial to make sure that it's safe and efficacious. So um, I hope that we don't just end up with herd immunity because uh, that's going to be a lot of people getting sick um, and a lot more deaths because in order to get herd immunity, we're talking about, I think it's like 70% of the population um, and uh, not knowing the long-term effects of this virus, I, I hope that that's not our plan to get there. Um, so thank you very much all for, for logging on for this. I hope that it was uh, interesting and informative. Um, I'm on Twitter at at Tim Cannon MD. I'm on Strava at uh, Tim Cannon, and my office is there at UCLA Health. We also have Sports Cardiology Clinic in Westwood at UCLA, um, and, and all of our primary doctors and everybody can be uh, available to answer your questions and, and do, um, especially if you got COVID and are trying to recover and get back into riding, um, you know, please come and talk to us, get some, some testing um, to make sure that it's safe to, to do that. So um, thank you all and uh, happy riding. Stay safe out there.